Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are joyful that you have brought us to your house. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now, we all know that Jesus is love. So sometimes we might wonder, where is God or Jesus? Of course, we know that he's in heaven, but he's also in the world. In fact, he is in every one of us. The teacher, the policeman, and even the guy that stands in the meeting of the intersection with the cardboard placard. Jesus speaks about how we should love. He even commands us to love our enemies. Some of what he says is very hard. It is hard for us to hear. And it is hard for us to comply with his commands. Indeed, he begins with a number of commands that seem counter to the human mindset. After all, who struck on his right cheek will turn to his adversary and say, why don't you try my left cheek too? My goodness, what is he asking of us? Well, let's look at this text for what it is. Jesus offers this ridiculous teaching to his closest followers, the apostles. Von Crow Tipton said, remember that anyone else who heard it probably laughed out loud and with good reason. The bugle call is to swim upstream. It asks the disciples to break with conventions, to stand out in the crowd, to find fulfillment in going a second, third, and even a 77th mile. Now, you probably are thinking that the good news is bad advice. The truth is much of the gospel is hard to hear or obey. Here, Jesus is asking us to love just as he loves. There is hardly a more complete characterization of agape love in all of scripture. A more complete characterization I don't imagine you are here this morning because you want to hear these challenging words. Of course, we might tend to land on the words, your reward will be great. And again, I remind you that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And it doesn't mean that if you love that rude neighbor or the released, they stick together, don't they? Pardon me. There we go. The released convict who moved in down the block. That you're going to receive all good things. Crow Tipton also says, more likely you're commanded to love the thief, the murderer, or the molester. In other words, the great reward we receive is not full pockets. The mansion on the hill or even self-esteem, but who we become in the process. Now Jesus already knows that we will never love our enemies without an amazing grace that transforms us and makes us different than who we are. Like the musician, the academic, or the athlete who train body, mind, and spirit and become what they need to practice their craft, we too can become more than the sum of our hearts. Yet the hard truth is that practice may make us better, but it will not make us Christian. What changes us and allows us to love is grace that is greater than our sin, our best intentions, or even our hard work. Well now, 
You all know the story of how Joseph was a proud and arrogant man. And because he applied a my way or the highway manner of directing his brothers, they came to despise him. They plotted what to do to get rid of him. They could not kill him. So they took him by force and threw him into a pit that he could not climb out of. And shortly they saw a caravan coming and they pulled him out and sold him to someone in this caravan headed to Egypt. You also know how God used this for good. One scholar, Eric Raymond, lists the similarities between Joseph and Jesus. Listen closely, and you will not know which of these describe Joseph or Jesus. He is the object of his father's special love. He had promises of divine exaltation. He was mocked by his family. He was sold for pieces of silver. He was stripped of his robe. He was delivered up to the Gentiles. He was falsely accused. He was faithful amid temptation. He was thrown into prison. He stood before rulers. His power was acknowledged by those in authority. He saves his rebellious brothers from death when they realize who he is. He is exalted after and through humiliation. He embraces God's purpose even though it brings him intense physical harm. He is the instrument God uses at the hands of the Gentiles to bless his people. He welcomes Gentiles to be part of his family. He gives hungry people bread. People must bow their knee before him. Just 18 of those. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus speaks about love and not just a philia kind of love, that feeling for our nearest and dearest. It is not eros that passionate form of love, but agape, which William Barclay says, it means an active feeling of benevolence towards other people. And it means no matter what others do to us, we will never allow ourselves to desire anything but their highest good and will deliberately and of set purpose go out of our way to be good and kind to them. If you think that stretches your will and your human mindset, listen to this quote. A man named Ava Zeno said, If a man wants God to hear his prayer quickly, then before he prays for anything else, even his own soul, when he stands and stretches out his hands toward God, he must pray with all his heart for his enemies. Through this action, God will hear everything that he asks. End quote. Now, many commentaries say at the point where our gospel begins, Jesus has sat like a rabbi and is speaking to his disciples. And that's certainly worth remembering when we read these. Returning to Joseph, years have passed since his brothers sold him into slavery. Now, his brothers must surrender to him. One might say this is a reversal of roles. Surrender is painful and a personal process with others. Yet, to surrender to a higher good does lead to a new life, love, and a deeper joy. Moreover, joy is a sign of reconciliation. As the brothers are brought into the presence of the living Joseph, they face their real guilt. But Joseph says, do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. 
Reconciliation is possible because in facing our shortcomings, our weaknesses, and even our hostilities, we come to understand that God's purposes were at work. Yes, God does use bad happenings to promote the good for us. And I did not say that God does bad things. They occur, and he uses them. He will use them for his and our advantage. Yet, I want to ask you to open up your memory vault. Think. Remember when we too were harsh, vengeful, unforgiving, or indifferent? In our relationships with our children, spouse, our neighbors, those we work with, or even in our church communities, if we reflect long enough, we will remember such hurtful experiences. Maybe we were brought to our knees and humbled by acknowledging our own grievous deeds. But God comes inviting us to receive his divine compassion in our brokenness. Looking back, we can see how God has been working within and among us and offering strength and meaning for our present and our future. All that Joseph's brothers have done races into their minds and into the light of Joseph's compassion they embrace with tears of their own wrongdoing, but also tears of joy for their brother's forgiveness. Painful happenings of facing the remembrances of our past with a willingness to give up our egos can put us humbly in a place where we can serve our God. I remember one chilly morning while I was still in the insurance business. I only had a dollar or two, so I stopped by my bank to use the ATM. It was located just inside the front door and separated by yet another door from the bank's interior. When I stepped in, there was a poorly dressed man who stepped out. Now, I had to remove my gloves to use the ATM. I withdrew a 20 so I'd have money for lunch, and almost immediately, I thought about the man who had stepped out. He was obviously homeless, and I could, could have given him my gloves and maybe a 20 so he could eat that day and part of the next. I looked for him, but did not find him. And I beat myself up the rest of the day and the rest of that week for not caring for one of God's children. And yet I still feel some guilt about it. Think, when you see people, maybe they need something. For sure, they face trials that you know nothing about. It is that heart and the belief in our God that makes us Christian. It's interesting, but... Do you realize that all other religions require you to earn their, your way into heaven? Paradise, utopia, or by whatever name they call the next world? Christianity is the only religion that in it we know we cannot earn our way into heaven but come to it through the grace and mercy of God. God who gave his only begotten son to become human and suffer many things and was crucified. He took the sins of the world on his shoulders when he died. And after he rose again on the third day, he could see a new world whereby all believers could be with him in eternity. After all, did he not say, I go to prepare a place for you? Amen.